the written communications today is a great chance to directly um, ask uh, and be shy about that. Then, uh, from last week, comment sheets for the students on hot topics in physics, I have uh, printed questions and answers. So you can take a copy of that if you are a member of hot topics in physics. And uh, because I need to take attendance, so here are the names of the students. So please sign your name up in here. Now, um, I want to uh, briefly introduce our two speakers. Um, um, the two speakers here uh, on my left is Peter Franken. He graduated in computer science from the Technical University in Bell, and he has been working in uh, IT departments and kind of uh, being the director of IT departments in big banks, like the uh, bank Shinsen Bank and now Monix Corporation. And so he's really reforming the way of management and uh, using IT. And uh, he also published a book sector together with an expert and uh, uh, then since 2011 he's acted as a director of SAFECAST for the uh, radiation measurements but exactly what that is uh, we'll say more about uh, and he's uh, credited to be the inventor of so-called AI Gaigi it's a guy that uh, working uh, together with an AI home the uh, second uh, researcher today is, uh, okay, uh, Peter is also a senior uh, visiting researcher at Cale University, and uh, uh, Joe Boros from the US is uh, a radiation expert with 45 years of professional experience in the radiation uh, measurement industry, etc. So he really has a very profound uh, both theoretical and practical knowledge. And, uh, um, is also uh, working, I think, nearly full time <laughs> with the same cast, and also is an associate researcher at uh, Yale University. And uh, so, for the rest, I will uh, give some the time. And please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, at any time. They would be happy to answer your questions. And you can also ask Japanese, they will uh, understand and be able to respond. Okay. Please. Uh, I will, one more thing. I was asked to mention, because it's, it's, uh, there, are two, there are two experts from an NGO, but uh, there are different types of NGOs. Sometimes you have Greenpeace, and they have a political environmental agenda, and uh, the, the, when they come, they advocate. But uh, the type of safecast, uh, what they, is their basic agenda, they'll say more about it, but what I understand is collecting high quality data. And now, this is a natural science forum, so there's no natural science without data. And so they provide an excellent service uh, to science, and I think uh, maybe other fields of science can also learn uh, from that how to collect such high uh, quality data. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, can you all hear me? Also in the back? We're good? Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about what we're doing, and as Eckhart already said, we're going to uh, talk a bit, but uh, we're going to really hopefully have lots of hard questions, and we'll do our best to answer those. And uh, we can have the questions in Japanese or in English. Nihongo demo, daijoubo, so this. So before I start, I want to show you a very short video, and in the video you get a very quick idea as to what we kind of do, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that more, so you can get a good good inside what, what it is we do. So the three of us are just talking, where can we find information? Oh, we can't find radiation data anywhere. And it's not because it's not being published, it's because it doesn't exist. Nobody was paying attention to this stuff. And so that's when we decided that we could start pooling our resources to get equipment, get equipment in people's hands, and go collect some of this data and publish it so that there at least be something available. Within a week, we had 20, 25 people who had all in this Skype chat room brainstorming and trying to figure out a solution to this problem. 
but would be online, we couldn't get any Geiger counters. Literally within 24 hours, the whole world supply was uh, sold out. When we realized that we couldn't get the equipment, we decided that the only way to get this done is let's go and build it ourselves. So we came up with the idea that if we put a Geiger counter on a car and we drive around with it, we can collect radiation and put it on the map. Only problem was is we didn't have the equipment, we didn't have the system. So solution was go to Tokyo Hackerspace, where there's lots of people that knew how to put things together. And on the sixth day after we had the idea, we had a working system. The next day we were off to Fukushima doing our first measurements. As we started taking the measurements, we saw that a reading can change like 100% just by crossing a street. And that's when we realized that it was really important for us to take very granular street-by-street street readings every five seconds and publish really granular data so that people can drill all the way down and see exactly what the reading is right in front of their house, not an average of the entire city. After a couple of months, we realized that it would be much better for volunteers to have something that would be very concise and compact. So we redeveloped the whole system and we were able to use Arduinos and open hardware to fit it into a bento box, and that's how we came up with the bento Geiger system. Once we built one, we taught other people to build many more of them, and that really allowed us to scale up dramatically. Wow, this is a disaster. This is a tremendous opportunity to take this tons of data that's being collected and try to understand what the effects on people is. That can only happen if we share the data and we put the medical data together with the radiation data. And right now, the key to combining data is to make it open. And so one of the really important features of the SafeCast project is we're using a CC0 public domain dedication for all of the data so that we can try to get people to do data science on it. We found out from Fukushima the experts really weren't very helpful. And in fact, that citizen science actually works. We were able to collect more data than all the projects in history. And a lot of scientists came together. And by pulling through the network, we were able to become the best in the world. So I think what SafeCast proves is that all the preparation in the world, all the money in the world, still fails if you don't have a rapid, agile, resilient system. Because of the internet, because of our agility, because of our openness, within weeks we had the world's experts together to do this, and within a year we're the biggest project that has ever existed in this kind of monitoring. And I think it really shows that with the right people and the right resources and agility, you can beat the pants off of any government pre-planning or institutional system. Okay, so uh, it was very quickly uh, how we started. And, uh, so Safeco started literally the day after the earthquake when uh, the Daiichi uh, problem started. We started to look around. And the reason we started is very simple. Uh, People like myself and uh, some of my friends and people around me all were wondering, uh, is there going to be any radiation fallout in the areas we were living? And uh, that, that kind of started to, uh, to get us uh, talking. But the problem was is that, how do we get information? So we thought it was a matter of, of going on the internet and, and see what is the radiation level in Japan. Uh, interestingly enough, and now it's very well known, there, is, there was no information that, uh, about radiation uh, at that time. Uh, later on we found out what happened. There was actually, uh, government had equipment to measure it, but it decided not to share that with, uh, with all of us. So because there was no data, uh, we, uh, we started to think around, and uh, we, we started to, to look around and we thought, okay, if there is no data, maybe we can find data from universities and other places or people that are measuring, and we collect all the data, we put it on a website. And then people can see the data and they can know what it is. Actually, we did do that. In one week's time, we had built a website with a big map, and we put data on it. And then once we had all the data that was available on the map, we found out that all the measurements were in only a few locations in Japan, primarily some in Tokyo and some universities, but nothing in the areas which we wanted to know about. So there was actually nothing. So after a week, we realized that our plan was not working and we uh, changed our uh, plan. So uh, then uh, when we were doing that, uh, uh, we found out, you know, so we had no data and we had no uh, people that could give us data. Then we thought, okay, if we maybe, if we buy lots of Geiger counters, then we can give it to lots of people and lots of people can collect the data and then upload it to our website. Uh, so that's actually what we then did next. We collected money. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kickstarter, it's a US uh, way to fund projects. So we created the project, and we got lots of people to fund this. 
So we got lots of money to buy 600 Geiger counters. But the problem was is that we couldn't find 600 Geiger counters. Actually, we could only find two Geiger counters at that time. We only had two, and we needed 600. So then, even though we had the money, uh, we then, again, realized that this was not working. So we had now we had money, we had money to buy Geiger counters, but we had no data. So then uh, what, we, uh, uh, what we did is, is we, we started to uh, get worried because at that time already three weeks had passed and we still had no real data about what was happening. And people got more and more and more concerned, specifically people that were living above uh, Tokyo, you know, Chiba and upwards, a lot of people got really, really worried. So we started to think, and at that time we all got together, and we sat down and said, what can we do with what we have? We have two Geiger counters. And um, I'm going to talk about what we exactly did, but basically uh, what we then said is, okay, we have money, we have, uh, uh, we have volunteers and people about that time. Lots of people had already said, we could be, you know, we're here to do something. And then we said, okay, what we're going to do is, is we're going to make our own equipment, and we're not going to give it to people to measure, we're going to put it on a car. And we're going to drive around, and as we drive, we collect the data, and we put it on the map, but using a GPS uh, satellite connection. So that allows us to know where we are, like when your, your mobile phone tells you where you are. So we know where we are, we collect the data, we collect the radiation data, we put it uh, on uh, in our computer, and then from the computer we bring it to the internet. And that was the plan. And uh, because we, we were running out of time, uh, we all sat down and we uh, basically uh, got a whole bunch of people together, people that can do hardware, software, devices, thinking, whatever. And then uh, within uh, six days, we actually built a system that very much looks like this. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. And that's what we did. And then we put it on the car, we switched it on, and miraculously, it did actually work. Uh, it did record, and it did create a map. And that's how we started. That was about the fourth week after the earthquake. If you want to see the, the first design, which has a laptop and a wire, it's on our car parked outside. And that's the oldest one still in use. Just the number two, the number one is in the museum. But yeah. uh, uh, that was made with uh, duct tape, and it was really you know, improvisation. But the key thing we did is at that time, and I know you got already explanations about radiation, we wanted to measure not only so-called gamma radiation, we also wanted to catch uh, beta radiation as much as we could, and alpha radiation, because we wanted to see if there was anything in the air besides things that are you know, fixed or whatever. So that was the, the special design we did. So the key thing is that what I was talking about, which is important to understand is, is that you know, we had actually, when we started, we had nothing. And we had no supply chain, no people, no money, no devices, no, no data, no nothing, right? And um, I will not talk about it too much today, but what is important to understand is how we actually did this is uh, we currently are a volunteer group. We have maybe between 100 to 150 volunteers continuously working on it in Japan. We have maybe 70 or 80 people that are always somehow doing something for safe cost. Well, lots of people are collecting data. Uh, how did we connect all of this? Was you know you need a supply chain if you want to do a big project. How do you get money? How do you get people? How do you get stuff? And the way we did this is 100% we used the internet to get us all the things. We got money through the internet. We got devices through the internet. We got people through the internet. We got data through the internet. We got basically everything we did. It happened through the internet. We got all these things to come to us. Then we assembled it here in Japan. And then we brought it out, we measured and we brought it back. What is very interesting is, is, uh, is that you can organize a tremendous amount of things through the internet, even though you're just one person with an idea. You can create an, 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 amazing, uh, an amazing amount of activity. So this is just very quickly, so you can see this. This is uh, you know, Kickstarter. This is what I talked about. You can, everybody can do this. Uh, you can see we collected $100,000, uh, set my yen, uh, in about uh, two weeks. So a very, very uh, fast way to, to get things going. Uh, so this is how we started. We started with three people, and in one week we had maybe 20 people. And today we have, as I said, 150 people that are, that are connected to, uh, to this project. Uh, so let me explain to you how we started. Uh, the, the first, before we actually started to build this equipment, we made a few uh, kind of trial uh, of the idea. And the first trial we did was, uh, there was a volunteer and he was driving to Ishinomaki to deliver uh, food. And he had a big truck. And the first thing we did is, is we gave him a Geiger counter. And I asked him, you know, every time you stop, 
just take a picture with your iPhone and upload it to our website so we can see the radiation level and we can also see where you are. So that was the first run. We did it, uh, I think, in the third week. And then through that, we got data back and we could see roughly what are the radiation levels around the highway all the way from Tokyo to, uh, to uh, Ishinomaki. And then we could see that in Fukushima, we could see the radiation levels go up. And, but it was very rough. We had maybe 10 measurements, the first measurement. Then the second attempt, what we did is, is at that time, we also were working together with K University. And with K University students, we're also going up to, I think, Kesanuma to help uh, rebuilding or, to, or help people. You know, at that time, was, was very, lots of things were happening. And what we did is, it's very hard to see, but this inside the car, this is outside the car. And this is duct tape, and this is the Geiger counter. So we put the Geiger counter on the car window, we duct taped it, and then every five minutes, they took a picture with the iPhone. And that gave us the first kind of map, because at that time we got maybe 200 measurements from Tokyo to Tohoku. And we could more precisely see what is happening. Also, what we could see is that actually this kind of works. The real problem is, is that this is not very uh, easy to do. You need to put it on your car, duct tape, iPhone. This is not very uh, uh, easy to do. So that was uh, that. So once problem we knew it, sir, problem with the rain. Oh, yeah, no, it, this, the, the, the sensor that is on these devices, if it, water cuts on it, is immediately destroyed. So you know, we also knew that this doesn't work when it rains. So, but we knew that the concept was working. So if the concept is working, uh, how do we make something that uh, is a little bit better than that? So that is. The first kind of system we built. You can see it here. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's a Geiger counter here. Inside a box, we have a small computer and uh, an Arduino board and a USB, uh, uh, you know, USB port. This is a GPS, a GPS uh, data loader. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, I just moved. This, is, this here is a GPS data logger you bought in Akihabara, 2000 yen. <laughs> this is uh, a 500 yen USB uh, uh, hub. This cable, this cable goes, this, this USB hub connects to the PC. This is not in the picture here. This is the Geiger counter. This here is a, is a hole in the box with a special uh, a piece of, uh, uh, of, looks like uh, aluminum folly, but it is actually Mylar shield which allows beta and alpha particles to go through. And this box here is, uh, is known as a pelican box. It's famous for photographers because it is water, waterproof box and it's very, very strong. So we put this all together and this became the first device and it looks basically like this. But the only difference was is we connected it to a, tool, a laptop computer, okay? So then with this system, we drove to Koryama. This was the first ride we did here. This is in Koryama. This is K, Professor K. Ohara from K University. Myself, uh, Steve Christie, uh, Batanabasan, and I forgot his name, but these are two people we met up with in Koryama, they're from, uh, from Koryama City. And this was the first drive. So the system actually started to collect data. The big difference between this mess here and this system here was is this every five seconds. This was every five minutes. So every five seconds basically means every 50 meters we were measuring radiation. And suddenly we could see lots of detail come in. And of course, when we went to Koryama, this is in April 23rd of 2011, uh, we measured much more radiation than in Tokyo, and we were actually quite, uh, uh, quite shocked as to what we found on that day. It was a kind of very confusing day, but it, the system worked. So then, once we knew it worked, we started to work harder. This is uh, Joe here and Colin. Uh, these are all volunteers, but also these are all people that are a member of a group of uh, uh, people that make things. And this is in, uh, in Tokyo. So we started to make more devices. As you can see, you now we have more devices, more devices coming. And the device we have here, what we did is, is we said, you know, the, the, the laptop computer is nice, but the uh, problem with laptop is, is that we needed two people in the car. One driving, one holding the laptop and making sure that the system would work and stuff. So we thought that if we have two people, then it's one too many. So if it is only one person, it's easier for people to use. Because lots of people just drive on their own. So what we did is, is we build a small computer inside the box that basically controls the, the GPS and controls the Geiger counter and uh, writes everything on a small SD card. So if you have an SD card, then most people can take out the SD card and upload it to our website because most people know how to use a digital camera. So it's really simple, but it is 
uh, something everybody can use. So that's what we did. So we started to build more of these. So the first thing we did is we all drove up ourselves. And we went to Fukushima, I went many, many times driving around. And we said, isn't it much easier if we give people devices so they can drive around themselves? So that's what we did. So we started to build more devices. And the, the one, this one, because it is really simple, there is only one switch on this device. So this is not made by Sony. Uh, it says only one switch. On and off. On and off. So it's really simple. Uh, before this, uh, most radiation measurement done required lots of equipment. And if it was done in a mobile way, uh, I saw people from other competing universities using a whole truck full of equipment to do exactly what we were doing. So by making it small and by making it simple, on, off, we could give it to anybody anywhere and say, you know, just put it on your car, just on, off, and just go drive. And you could see on the, in, the, in the video, right, it goes on the car window, it takes about five seconds or so to put it on. So, and it fits on any car. We have had lots of cars and it, we never had trouble putting it on. So, then we also did a little bit of innovation. Not everybody has a car, so student, this is uh, Robin, he's a student. Uh, you can do this on your bicycle. And uh, we were very lucky. We got the sponsored Tesla. I'm not sure if you know these cars. Uh, they're very, very expensive uh, electrical cars. And here is our device on here. So we use this to do Tokyo. And this is our car. It's outside right now. And if you have time after this, you can see it. Here you can see we have two devices on here. And uh, with this, these two devices, we have actually measured a lot. Uh, here you can see these are volunteers in Iwaki City. This is uh, Yamadera-san and Brett Waterman. And this is his car. And you can see here he put it on his car window. With one device, he was able to measure entire Iwaki City in about three weeks. I'm not sure if you know Iwaki City. Anybody who's been to Iwaki City? Not yet. Iwaki City is, is, is a city in Japan. It's a very large city. Uh, it's it's very wide city, so it's it's not a, like a village. It is a you know, it is it is famous for Toyota and whatever manufacturing. But as a city, it's really really big. So he drove tremendous amount of uh, streets, and he drove every street in Iwaki City. His closest, closest point is about 25 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi, and the farthest point away is about 35 or 38 kilometers from Daiichi. So actually, very close to the evacuated area, and due south of the. Of so then we got more volunteers. So these are volunteers that are based in Aizu Wakamatsu. And uh, I think there's about six people. And they uh, got about three devices. And they used those three devices to measure a good part of Fukushima Prefecture, actually. Uh, then we had a problem. The problem was is that, as you know, there, there's evacuation zone, 20 kilometer zone. Uh, I'm not sure. Has anybody been to Fukushima recently? Nobody? OK. Uh, if we, I need to explain a lot. <laughs> I was there last week. <laughs> okay. Fuk Fukushima, you have the exclusion zone, right? You all know that 20 kilometers zone, you can't go in. So that also applies to us. Even though we are researchers and whatever, it doesn't make any difference. You can't go in. So, we get permission sometimes. Uh, okay. Now we do. Now we do. Yeah. But at that time, we couldn't go in. So what we did is, is we started to wait a bit. You know, through our relationship with Keio University, we built a relationship with uh, Tokyo University, and we also had people that were evacuated out of the area, they sometimes were able to go in. So what we did is, is we got our device with those people. So our volunteers and Kate University and Tokyo University, they had ability to go in and they drove in with our equipment. So as a result, uh, this is actually inside the 20 kilometers zone. This is a researcher from uh, Tsukimura, right? Tsukimura so from the Tokyo uh, I yeah. Radio Isotope Laboratory at Tokyo University. Tokyo University. And he used our system to go into the exclusion zone. He was already measuring there. The problem he had was that he was using a Geiger counter and he was writing it down on a piece of paper. So he would walk around and make, make notes. And the moment he got our system, he was very happy because he doesn't have to do anything. He just walks and automatically records. You just have to look around. So he could very quickly start uh, getting much more information out. So, uh, and then this is the first map we made. This is Daiichi here. This is the first measurements we did around Daiichi. You can see here all these dots here. The uh, right. And the closest we have measured now today is, is up to here. So now, after a year and a half, we have measured the entire zone. But it was very important because lots of people that were evacuated, like us, wanted to know what are the levels where they were evacuated from. So what we did is, is we put all this data on the internet. And this is a, a person he was evacuated from, I think, Nami City. And with our map, this is where we met him in uh, Aizu Misato. He was able to basically use our map to see what was happening around his house. And uh, then 
uh, what happened next was is that the more and more people came to know what we're doing, and uh, cities or villages in Fukushima Prefecture, they also wanted to know more about what happened in their, uh, in their neighborhood. So we started to get requests from local government to give them the same equipment and measure with it. So this is the, the mayor of, you can see, Kawauchi Mura, Kaido Kawauchi, this is the poster they made. This is in, in uh, Koryama, because they, they moved the, the, the city hall uh, in, in Koryama. And they were evacuated, so there's, they couldn't use their own city hall because it's inside the 20 kilometer zone. So this is at their temporary city hall in Koryama. So they started to measure as well. Okay, so this is what we did. So more and more devices we built as volunteers. More people volunteered to put the device on their car, which was really easy. So most people said, oh, wow, this is so easy. And people started to measure around their neighborhood. For most people, it's very simple. You want to know where you are, your own street. You want to know where your kids go to school. You want to know where you're, you know, where you're going out in the evening. So people started to measure their, their neighborhood. And this was a very uh, important uh, logic because if you want to measure an area that you don't have emotional attachment with, you don't do it. But if it is your own environment, lots of people got really excited to go and do it and then share it. Now at SafeCast, we talked about uh, one specific type of measurement. We measure at around this height on a car, and we measure primarily gamma radiation. Uh, technically, we measure beta and gamma on the device, but practically we measure uh, gamma radiation at the moment. But we also wanted to know not only what is the dose rate, you know, how much radiation is here, we also wanted to know where is it coming from. So we have some devices with us, and these are two of the devices we have. Uh, that allow us to see what kind of isotopes there actually are in the environment. So these are gamma spectrometers, and uh, we got trained on how to use these. These are fairly complex devices. Uh, they're easy to use, but what comes out of it, the data that comes out of it, is not so easy to understand. Uh, but we used these devices in the beginning to I actually identify what isotopes were there in the environment. So we used it to, to figure out is there, you know, what, what is out there. Uh, we found lots of cesium, basically. Very, you know, now it's very logical, but at that time there was lots of concern what is out there. And we used this to, to, to do that. We still use these devices today, but uh, because we kind of know what the isotopes are, we have started to use them very occasionally in case we really want to want to do a verification. They're also our calibration source. Because they are very uh, traceable, we understand they have, they're very well characterized, we use them to uh, figure out how much the rate is to calibrate these. So that these are very simple devices and very inexpensive, but we're still very confident that they're getting a, a rate a reading that's accurate because we check them with the more expensive devices. Uh, right now. Then uh, we also uh, have tried to measure uh, particles inside the air. So this is a system. This is actually kind of like a vacuum cleaner. It's basically an air pump that pumps air through a filter. And then on the filter we catch particles. And there's different types of filters. So you have filters that catch small particles or bigger particles. And then based on the, the, this measurement, we have been trying to measure if there was something in the air. Uh, we started this uh, quite a bit after the disaster. And I don't think we have found anything. No, we didn't get it in time. The, uh, yeah. By the time we had the, the, the meter air pump, uh, there was, everything was bonded to the, to the surface. And only when there's a, uh, areas where there was loose dust that was contaminated and then there'd be a big wind, so it'd be a dust storm, would you find any contamination in the air? So that's been, fortunately, not finding uh, any contamination in the air, even in Iwaki City and uh, Koryama, where we used it up close to the plant. So, so just to uh, explain a little bit of what Joe was talking about, when we did all of this, to be to be frank, besides Joe, myself, my, my background is not uh, measuring radiation. My background is I'm an electrical and computer engineer. Uh, I know a bit about this. I did lots of physics when I was in university. But uh, how it all worked was not very clear. So at the beginning, uh, lots of people thought that radiation is coming from above every time it rains. It's kind of logical in a way if you, if, you know, say it comes from above. But in reality, it did came through rain, but it only came probably once. Well, depending where you were in, in Tokyo, there was one, probably one event. Koryama and Nihon Matsu Few. probably had two events. Uh, right near the plant, it was probably happening every day, every other day for several weeks. But what was interesting is, is that once we started to measure, we not only measured in the air, but we started to measure at one centimeter above the, of the ground, and we started to investigate you know, where is this radiation coming from? So the radiation actually today comes from below. It comes from this, from the, from.
from the, the street you're standing on or that comes from the soil in the farmland. That's where everything went down, and that currently radiates up. So the radiation is actually below you and not above you. This is very important to understand. Uh, then the second thing we understood, came to understand this, is that it was cesium, and that was primarily left in the environment. So all the iodine was, was gone in the first two, three weeks, but also there was not much really else that was out there. So in cesium, uh, once it, five, once it uh, when it came out of the plant, it became airborne because it was uh, solved in, in the water of the, you know, in, in the clouds. In humidity. In humidity, right? So it, it goes up and it stays there. But the moment the, the, the cesium came down and was able to react uh, with other uh, things besides water, it started to very quickly react with uh, things like sand or, or Clay, metal. stone, glass, cellulose from wood and paper. fibers and yep. paper, uh, leaves. It's a highly reactive, chemical highly reactive compound, which means that it basically reacts very fast. And once it is reacted, it becomes oxide, right? Uh, so look, it, it, uh, on stones and uh, clays and uh, things like that, it forms uh, cesium silicate, which is a kind of glass. On uh, uh, hydrocarbons and things like leaves and wood and stuff, it forms something else, which I'm not as sure of, but also very firmly bonded to the, to the solid. So, so if you understand that, you know, if it is like a glass or something like that, it's like, it's like the coating on your car. It is very hard to get off. So what we found out is, is that this stuff is everywhere, and it is hard to get off, and it stays there. So it basically keeps on radiating. Then we did lots of other experiments we can talk about later, but we basically were able to to understand where is it, how is it behaving in the environment, and we're still studying that as of today, how it continues. Most of the other things we measured above water. Lots of people uh, asked about it, you know, what's in the ocean. A uh, simple answer is there's no radiation measurable in the ocean. There is, it doesn't mean there's no pollution. But uh, above water, uh, there's almost nothing you measure. It's very simple. Water is a very good shield of radiation. So anything that's in the water, you will not measure above the water. And because if you're on the ocean, the only radiation that really comes is, is uh, background radiation, is, uh, which comes from, uh, from outside our, uh, our planet. So typically above water, we measured pure uh, background or, or cosmic, cosmic rays. Yeah. Um, we also started to measure, this is not uh, immediately but we're measuring it right now, we started to measure radiation in airplanes. And uh, uh, this is something uh, we started doing only once we could build the equipment uh, to make it happen. Uh, in an airplane, when you fly, you go, up, up, you go up 10 kilometers in the, in, you know, in, in the sky. Uh, once you're above the, uh, the clouds, etc., the, the shield that is around the Earth that shields us from the background radiation becomes thinner and thinner. So you get more and more radiation. So we measure it in airplanes. So typically in an airplane, if you fly to the US, you get about five, maximum 10 microsieverts an hour, which is maybe 50 to, uh, to 100 times more than what you get here on the ground. Uh, it depends on how you, how you fly. This was actually last week I went to Hong Kong and I was measuring in the airplane to Hong Kong, there's about one to one and a half microsieverts in the airplane. The uh, times we've seen is eight and a half. It depends on the actual altitude of the plane, activity from the sun, uh, where we are in our orbit, how far north you are. There's a lot of different factors. The reason we're measuring this is, is that actually there's almost no measurements done of radiation in airplanes. Even though we take airplanes every day and we are exposed to radiation, there's very limited information available. So we're measuring this right now. And there's various groups of people. You can guess what types of groups of people are interested in this. So we're trying to collect it in the same ideas as sharing it. Uh, OK, so what have we done now? Uh, we built about 50 of these devices all together, I think, roughly. Yeah, about 50. Uh, we built more than 50. I think but there's still 50 working. 50 working or something yeah. like that. Uh, Some died. As of today, we have about close to 6 million locations measured with those devices. This is, as of end of last year, 5 million. And we almost going to cross 6 million, so. Uh, Probably next week. Next week, yeah. So the amount of data, as you can see in the beginning, we started with you know with zero, literally echo, with nothing, and uh, slowly increased because this is the speed at which we could build devices. But we have been building more and more devices because we could make them easier to build, so we could build more. And you can see that the amount of data that we're collecting is increasing uh, exponentially at the moment. Uh, so what, what, what does it look like? So uh, in the video, uh, Joe Ito was talking about uh, CC0. CC0 basically means that all the things we do, we make it available in the public domain. And there are a very simple license that means that all our data can be used freely. 
can be used freely by individuals, can be used freely by companies, can be used freely by universities, can be used freely by governments. There's no copyright on anything we do. This is very important for us uh, as a group because we felt that putting copyright on radiation measurements is not the right thing to do. Unfortunately today, most of the data collected by Japanese government and Japanese broadcasters is protected by copyright and we feel that uh, that is uh, nonsense because this data should be available freely so that we can solve the problem we have. So our data, you can copy it, you can do anything you like with it, you don't have to sign up, it is, you, there's a simple link, you click on it and you get all five million data points and you can do something with it. So what happened is, is lots of people started to download our data and do th different things with it. So if you go to our homepage, you can see there is maybe about five or ten maps that you can uh, check out. Uh, other universities have started to use our data. Uh, some companies use our data. Uh, we know local governments are using our data. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so that making it available started to become uh, not only our website, but people can download it and do something else with it. Uh, this is the, the map. I'm going to see if I, if I can show it to you. Website, you can uh, uh, see this map. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. So here you can see that are the map of Japan. All right. And uh, we are currently here in Tokyo. Way over the line. Somewhere here, here, right? Over here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to see because of the. Uh, Colors. You can see there's a little bit different coloration here, right? This is Chiba, this is around Kashiwa, this is so called the Chiba hotspot. This goes here, the radiation levels go up a little bit. In reality, the fallout went all the way up around here. In Tokyo, you can measure almost all locations in Tokyo, you can see that there's cesium on the surface. Uh, in the air, you can measure it, but it is not so big difference as uh, what you will see elsewhere. Even here, if you go outside, or in Tokyo, and you have a Geiger counter, and you want to know if these bricks are new or more than two years old, it's very easy to tell. If they were outside in April, in March and April of 2011, they'll have cesium bond at the top of them. If somebody turns one over, it's easy to tell. So then you can, I'll, I'll just try to zoom in a little bit around, you know, if you go to Waki or something. You see, this is the, this is the, the nuclear plant is around here. Um, As we zoom in, you can see that we get more and more detail. And more detail. More detail. You can even go that way. OK, so here, I can click on a dot here. And here you can see what we measure. We measure counts per minute. Actually, what we measure is not microsieverts per hour or anything. We measure counts per minute. The reason we measure counts per minute is, is that is actually the measurement. The devices we have, the Geiger tubes, basically produce ticks of each nuclide going through the sensor, and that is what we store. Then later on, we compute from that counts per minute, we can compute the microsieverts per hour based on a conversion factor that has to do with the type of nuclide, which is in this case cesium, we can find out the relationship. But we store the raw data we store is in counts per minute. And here on, on the map, you can see there is a button here that says microsieverts per hour. You can click on that button and it tells us this is 0 0.34 microsieverts an hour here. All right. So with the data we have, you can zoom in and you can see at the street level, you can start to see exactly what, what was measured. Uh, another thing uh, that, we, what, that you can do with data is, is that uh, here, for example, I'm sorry, look carefully. All right, so it's good. Um, so it's good. You can see here it talks about nuclear <coughs> reactors, right? So we can put on the map, we can put a layer, and we can show where nuclear reactors are. But the other thing we can do is, uh, the layer is on. Yeah, but there are, no, there, there, are no, there are no nuclear reactors in Minami Soma. But we can also switch on another layer here. Let me take a few seconds, let me go and zoom out. Uh, 
Yeah, it's coming, it's coming from. Okay, so you see the epicenter is the earthquakes. Okay, so what we started to do is, is, and is you can overlay radiation data with other data. So this is an example of overlaying radiation data with earthquake uh, data. So each, each circle on this map is an earthquake, and the size of the, the circle is the size of the earthquake. Uh, this uh, map was uh, uh, built by students in MIT Media Lab in, uh, in, in the US. And they were working on a visualization technique to allow people to bring in different types of data and start seeing maybe specific relationship between the radiation level or, or whatever. Um, this is a, a rather interesting technique because you can start combining things that, you know, what does it mean? For example, if we would have medical data about medical symptoms, we could see location versus medical problem. Another thing that is important about this map is you can also overlay population density with radiation level. Why is that important? Is that if you're going to do decontamination, if you're going to clean up, uh, you may have, and you can see that here, you may have very high radiation in this area, let's say here. But if there's nobody living in that area, now why would you go and put all your effort in cleaning up that area? So one of the things that we talk about right now is, is that population density and dose rate should be considered as a, to prioritize uh, where governments should clean up. Currently, they don't do that. They are cleaning up where it is high and where most people have been evacuated. That's where most of their money is being spent today. So from a policy perspective, you can start you can start seeing you know, why, why would we do things differently? How does all the data come together? So this is an ongoing project at the moment, and we're expanding this, uh, this data set uh, as we go. Uh, I want to go back and show you one or two examples. This is uh, the Fukushima prefectural government. They took our data, uh, downloaded it from a website, and they made a map for people in Fukushima to show radiation outside of Japan. Uh, because the inside uh, data they get it from METI, uh, but the outside data they have nothing. So here you can see they're, they're showing various spots in the world. And these spots have been measured by our volunteers as well. Uh, we took the, the same devices, we took them to uh, US, or Europe, Hawaii, Hong Kong, all kind of places. And with exactly the same device we measured. So you can compare. How does it compare? How does it compare with Hawaii or how does it compare with, with, uh, with New York or whatever? And the data is available. Uh, interestingly enough, we didn't find much locations with the radiation uh, above Tokyo. The only real location we have found is Hong Kong. Uh, and the other location, obviously, is Hong Kong, Denver. Yeah, and they uh, condemn it. It's, it's higher than all. Than and, uh, and Chernobyl. Uh, because, you know, they have, they, have a, they have a problem there, but we measure there as well. So, but this allows you to create a context. Because the real problem with radiation is, is that when uh, when the disaster happened and I got my first Geiger count and I switched it on and I looked at it and I said, oh my God, you know, look at all this radiation and my wife was very, very shocked. She said, oh, it's not zero. The radiation is never zero. So if it is never zero, how do you understand, you know, is this okay or not okay? So in order to communicate to people to say, you know, is 0.1 micro C, what does it mean? Uh, how much does it compare with another location I know? Then this becomes very important because we as humans want to have some kind of a way to compare. The absolute value is of no real meaning to us. We want to say, you know, how much is it here versus there? So lots of people use our maps to compare between locations. And uh, that is uh, one thing. Uh, then we did another project. Uh, instead of driving around, we uh, also built about 300 devices that are fixed fixed location. And we put these 300 devices all over Japan. And this was a project done together with K University. And this was uh, sponsored by uh, uh, SoftBank. And SoftBank shops were used to put the equipment. And this gave us a map of radiation. This, the whole idea here is, is not to uh, uh, measure lots of locations. The idea is, is to see how things change over time. Or if there is a change in the environment, we can see something happening. So this network. Uh, was built and still running, and you can go to Yahoo and see that. Uh, then, uh, what can you do with data? And what can you do with a Geiger counter? So, 
uh, we now have lots of measurements, and uh, one problem is and was is that Geiger counters are are expensive, and lots of people don't know what you know how to use one or whatever. So, if you want to know what your radiation is around you, how would you know it? How could you see it? So, of course, you can go home and look on the PC, but. Uh, what we did is, is we put all the data on uh, an, an app. You can download the app, and the app has all the data in it. And you can just basically use this app to uh, to see where you are. You can see, I mean, I mean this is going to be a challenge, but you can see this little dot here. Right? This is a GPS location. I'm just going to zoom in where we are today. And you see Mitaka, right? You see that? Mitaka. This is the campus here. And we are here, you can see here, you can play it only. This is where we are right now. You can see that I, I suspect Eckhart has been measuring around this building. <laughs> but uh, Eckhart is a volunteer, so he's been measuring around the school as well. You can see the measurements here. Now, green means less than 0 0.2 microsieverts. Uh, I just measured outside, is about 0 0.1, 0 0.09 microsieverts in front of the entrance. So here you can see that, you know, you cannot put it on an app. and Instead of having a Gaga counter, I can walk around with my iPhone and I can see radiation level uh, as a virtual device. And uh, this allows people to see where you are. If you go to Fukushima, you can literally walk around with it, you can see it change, but there's no Gaga counter, but that's what we measure. So, uh, lots of powerful things you can do uh, if you combine technology together. By the way, if you want to try out this app, it's in the App Store, it's of course free. You need Wi Fi to download it because it has a huge database built in, so it can't do it over 3G. Uh, and I recommend you try to use it, and if you've used it, please share it with your friends and have everybody download one, because it's very useful. Uh, we also did other things. We actually <coughs> redesigned the Geiger counter, and we don't have one with us today. I thought you had yours. No, mine is in the office. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we don't have one here today. But you can see it. So uh, we actually redesigned uh, 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 you know, we designed the Geiger counter, uh, a few of the volunteers we have are actually professional hardware designers, and we designed the Geiger counter that we felt uh, had all the functions we wanted it to have, and also had form factor really small, really compact. This thing is the same size as an iPhone 5, a little bit thicker, but it has a computer built in, it's open source uh, uh, device. You don't have one, right? I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, no. <coughs> so, and this thing, uh, we funded it with a Kickstarter campaign, uh, and I think about in February, people will start receiving it. It's a quite a good device, uh, has uh, all the functionality we thought it should have, uh, and it will become commercial product. Uh, some company will commercially make it. We made it an open design. So as volunteers, we designed this device, we made the hardware open, the software open, and the design is open. So anybody actually can copy this and we don't care about it. Our interest is, is to get data, right, not to sell devices. So we're very excited that other people are actually making it a commercial point. Um, okay, so the final kind of thing I'm gonna show you is where we are today. And um, on the way here, I was using this device to measure. We started with these ones. And uh, as you understood, we as a volunteer group, we have designed this device and we're building this and we, we're giving it, we lending it out for free to our volunteers anywhere. So if you want to measure, you contact us, we'll send you the device, you measure and you send it back to us. But uh, there's also lots of people that wanted to have one or build one. And the devices we have, you know, though you can make them yourself, they were not so easy to put together. And the biggest problem is, is that it, that it a problem actually has an advantage, but one problem is, is it uses a, a Geiger counter that is relatively expensive. So for lots of people, it was, you know, uh, you know it's, it's around Ju Ma Yen, 100,000 you know, 100, yen to uh, build one, and we wanted to have something cheaper. Also, some more than half of that is just for this part. Th this part here. So the sensor and the device. So that was kind of a bottleneck to have people build their own. So what, what we did is, is we we came up with a smaller version, but also something that can be built very easily by uh, people that uh, by, you know, have a little bit of skill in soldering or whatever. So what we did is, is we, we removed the Geiger counter and we put a sensor here and some electronics. Same sensor. Exactly the same sensor. Right? This is very important, by the way. We always measure with the same sensor to make sure that all our measurements are consistent. This is a huge problem with all the measurements, unfortunately, the government has done. 
is measured with lots of different equipment, so it's not easy to compare anything with anything else. And more unfortunately is they don't even tell us what equipment they use, so we don't know what it was measured with. Which is for if you do, uh, if you're into measuring radiation, actually it's really important to know what sensor was used, because each sensor reacts differently to radiation, and that is kind of a characteristic you want to know when you're actually interpreting or uh, the measurements you see. So then we put a computer on this. Does anybody know about Arduino? Anybody is Arduino? No? Okay, so this is an other class. <laughs> but Arduino is a small computer on a small board which you can program very easily with your computer and you can make things with it. You can make a flashlight or whatever. In this case, we used an, Ar an Arduino board. It's about, you can see this, it's about this big. It's a very small board. It has a CPU on there, it has memory, it has uh, a volatile memory, uh, uh, persistent memory, uh, it has analog input, output, digital input, output. So it's a, it's a, it's a microcontroller. Uh, but Arduino is famous because it is really easy to use. Almost anybody can build something with it in you know, a few hours. Even if you don't know programming, it is actually so easy to use. So we use that platform to build this device. And then we put a display and we put a, this thing here as a GPS modem. Uh, this actually connects to the uh, to the satellite, and then there is a small little device here that writes on the SD card. So this is kind of a general purpose computer that allows us to program it, get GPS location, display it, and control the entire system. So that is what it, what it is. So uh, then some other volunteer made a printed circuit board. You see this here. And now you can buy all these parts and you can solder it together probably in, a, in an afternoon and you can build this yourself. So uh, why is that important is, is that if you can build it yourself in an afternoon, uh, then for us as a group, this is very exciting because lots of people can start building it. Now we have uh, our you know, volunteers that we have, have, have gathered that are doing it together. Now almost anybody can do it. And this is almost ready. We expect this, uh, we, we built the first kit versions uh, about a week ago, and uh, about another couple of weeks, we're away from making this available so anybody can, uh, can do this. It's a little bit unprecedented in hardware development to have basically a seventh generation device a little less than 20 months after we started. Yeah, we're, we're, we recycle faster than Apple or whatever, okay. <laughs> or any Japanese maker. But, uh, the reason we kept on changing it is because we kept on reacting to what we were, were doing. And the needs kept on changing. In the beginning, the need was very simple. Any data, get any data. Just get data. Today, we're now a year, almost two years after the disaster. Now, uh, there's lots of people that want to measure for decontamination. So there's much more need for a device like this, smaller, more robust, easier to operate. Also, the need now is, is how can we make it easily? Well, when we built the first device, Nobody cared if it was easy to make. We just focused on how to get the data. Also, the cost, the first device we built was about Niju Mayen, about $2,000, because we used a laptop and we used all kinds of parts. And we made a couple of mistakes. And we made mistakes, and you know, we learned from those. But what is important is, is, and because you're not familiar with Arduino and open hardware, I would really urge you to start learning about this. Because what is really important is, is if this was 10 years ago, then I would not have been able to manufacture this myself. This would have been manufactured by a company. And if a company makes something like this, it would cost maybe between fifty to hundred thousand dollars of development cost, if not more. And it would have taken at least six months to a year to get to anything like this. So today, because of the huge advance in technology, uh, for example, this you see this part here, this is cut by a laser cutter. But this laser cutter is in Shibuya in a cafe. So I go to the cafe, I get a coffee or a cup of tea. And then in that place, I can cut this out myself. All the boards and computer parts are available on internet, or you can go to Akihabara and buy them. So there is nothing in here that, that, any, that is anything special. So basically, by using today's technology, you as an individual, as a student or as a small volunteer group, you can build high-end equipment uh, very, very quickly. And that's what Joe was saying. We have done now seven versions of this in a very short amount of time because the cost in this is really, really low. If your company, every time is fifty to hundred thousand dollars, would have meant close to a million dollars of cycling. This has cost almost nothing. I mean, it costs money, but you know, the the, the amount of money. Volunteers are unpaid. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of effort. In it. But you know, we we we, get, we have some small money that 
people donate to us, but that money is, a, is, a, is, is really very, very small compared to what a normal company would do. So what, it, what makes it exciting is, is as a, me as, a, as a, an engineer and scientist, is that suddenly we can make things ourselves. We don't have to rely on uh, other people. In the case of the Fukushima disaster, unfortunately, we couldn't rely on the government telling us what was happening. We had to go and get the data ourselves. And uh, when I meet people and say, is this good or bad? My personal opinion is, is that we as citizens, sometimes we as citizens are the country. We as citizens have to step out and do things as a group to make things happen in society. So this is a very good area where you know scientists, individuals, lots of people can get together and can move really fast uh, if they want to. So that is, uh, th that is one of the, the learnings. OK, so I have talked more than enough. <laughs> So I would like to uh, 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 I would like to go for questions, and I hope you have some good questions. And Joe uh, uh, is, knows a lot about radiation management, so if you have a really difficult question, I really urge you to ask it now. This is a great opportunity. Uh, please go ahead. I'm getting international relations and global environment, okay. and uh, I also invite like some NGO. On, on that and the that issues. Yeah, that's you. Actually, uh, this is a, a constituency of a, a former Prime Minister Khan, and uh, people, uh, living, yeah, especially housewives, are, are collecting data by themselves. Uh, but on, especially on food. Okay, so this is basically for uh, radiation. This is environmental measure. External, yes. external yes. exposure. Uh, can you, this technology can be used for uh, internal exposure? This, these machines aren't used for measuring internal exposure or measuring food because there's a little bit different parameters. We are trying and have been trying since very early on to do the same kind of thing, which is to make a very low cost, um, easy to use uh, device for measuring both uh, whole body measure, uh, contamination for people and for measuring food. We haven't had as much success uh, with that project. We haven't given up, it's just that Measuring food is substantially more difficult, because partly because the food itself shields some of the radiation, and so we don't get as much uh, infra, uh, radiation out of it to be able to remote measure it from the sensor nearby or, or not inside the food. And also, the amount of radiation that we consider a problematic inside food, something you're going to consume, is much lower. Okay? What well, would be a tolerable amount of contamination on a sidewalk that you're just going to walk over and touch with your shoes and leave behind is much, much more than we could tolerate in something we're going to consume is going to become part of our body. So the amount of radiation we can tolerate in foods and uh, water is so much lower, so we need much more sensitive equipment to be able to measure it to levels that we would worry about. If we had something that was very contaminated, you know, somebody brings me a, uh, some rice that's 5,000 becquerels per kilogram, yeah, we can measure with this, we can find out, we can see the radiation off it, but that's 50 times higher than what the government guideline is for what we want to sell in the market. So we need something 50 times more sensitive to be sure that the contamination is below the level we want to, to screen for. And so it's been difficult to, uh, to make something low cost to address that problem. I'm wondering why you put uh, two devices on the car. You should have two. And uh, I, uh, I'm not saying. Yeah, that's all right. Whether it's two. Because uh, uh, for internal exposure, alpha, beta might be more important. And uh, gamma, x ray, it's a. Alpha and system. beta is not more critical from internal exposure. The reason we talk about alpha and beta sources with an internal exposure is that beta and alpha sources pretty much can't hurt us from outside right, right, right. because they can't get through our skin. They can only hurt us if they're internal exposure. Gamma is just as damaging if it's coming from an internal source or an external source. Mm. So we don't say that the alpha and beta are the only thing to worry about internally. You also have to worry about gamma sources if you ingest them. It's just that alpha and beta is only going to harm you if you get it inside. Right, right. So, so two devices, is it just for? Two devices? Yes. On the car, there were two devices on the car. Why on the picture different? with two devices on the car, one was the old one, one was the newest ah, one. See, we were trying to make sure that they were comparable. And that was, so that was an established device right. with a prototype to make sure that they read the same. So we, in that particular and both day. Both devices were focusing on, on uh, gamma and beta. Uh, sorry? Gamma and beta. Yeah. Gamma, gamma and beta? 
I don't understand the question. They are taking that. What kind of radiation? These devices are sensitive to alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Okay, we've only found um, primarily gamma sources uh, up in Fukushima. Mm -hmm. The cesium that's on the ground gives off a lot of beta, mm -hmm. but the beta doesn't go very far. And so on I the car with the, cool. with the window facing a little bit up, we, we see very little beta. The reason it was important to have sensitivity to all of those early on, we didn't know what was out there. You know, we don't know if it's in the air, we don't know if it's on the ground, if it's in the moisture. Okay, if, if there were something, Xenon 55, uh, the iodine 131, those don't stick to the ground the same way as cesium does. And if we drove through a cloud of that, and we were completely blind to it like a scintillator would be, we wouldn't even know. So we had to have a device that would be sensitive to all of them so we would make sure we wouldn't miss some isotope that wasn't identified yet. Now, this long in the, down the road, we know that the stuff in the environment now is cesium-137 and cesium-134. But we didn't know that early on. So now the sensitivity to, uh, to alpha and beta is not so important. And outside of Japan, uh, we've deployed a couple of these that don't have the thin window. Because in areas where they're not expecting any contamination, then it wasn't so important to have uh, the sensitivity and it makes it more fragile. So the gamma sensitivity becomes a little bit less with the other window, but we compensate for that. Uh, I'm Mark Longer. I uh, teach sustainability here, and I'm, I'm in the education uh, department. And uh, I'm researching water literacy. You mentioned uh, that water is an excellent protector, shield from radiation. But I, I assume that's because it kind of uh, dissipates. Um, no, if two reasons. One, uh, the ocean, we don't find the radiation there because when the radiation contamination that fell, fell in the ocean, it's the same as snow falling in the ocean. It doesn't build up and you don't get snow drifts on top of the waves because it mixes into the water. So there's nothing on the surface to radiate us. But also water, in its, because of its density, even if you put a source behind a meter of water, the radiation doesn't come through because it's a shield. So if you have a, a contaminated uh, rock or stone sitting on the ground here, it'll radiate you because the air is not dense enough to stop the radiation hitting you. But if you put it you know, in 50 centimeters of water or a, or a meter of water only, you can't even find it from the surface because it's, the water itself is physically blocking the radiation. So um, is it throughout the water or deep? It sounds... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The contamination... Uh, one of the things we don't know a lot about, we're starting to research, and, and my trip to Fukushima tomorrow is addressing, is what's in the water. Mm -hmm. okay, we know what's on the land because we've checked it. But the mechanisms that bring the contamination through the air and onto the land don't always apply in the ocean. Mm -hmm. okay? The cesium blew out over the water, it fell on it, and it settled to the bottom. So we know be, we're pretty confident there'll be cesium-137 there. But things could have drained out of the plant with the rain, or mechanically, or some other processes that didn't require it to get airborne. So there may be things in the ocean, especially right off of the Daiichi plant, um, that we don't find on the land. There may be isotopes from heavier metals or, or lots of things are possible. Um, we hope it hasn't spread very far, but we need to start checking that as soon as possible. What about freshwater bodies? Freshwater bodies, uh, most of our drinking water comes from uh, uh, higher altitudes and things, water that filters down through uh, the geology or off of the land and into lakes and rivers. Um, what we know from uh, the experience in Chernobyl is that cesium doesn't move well in the environment. Okay, it tends to stay where it is. If it's stuck to a rock, wherever that rock goes, that's where the cesium goes. But if it's stuck to a very tall, small piece of sand, small enough to become silt, and that gets in the water stream, then that gets into uh, things. But that's easy to filter out. We filter it out the same way we filter out sand and, and, and silt in the water. Okay, so, uh, but if you're, the other next thing that happens is, if the contamination gets in the silt on the bottom of the bed, and then a uh, fish comes along and is eating the algae and stuff on it, and that's ingesting it, then that, contamination is in the fish, we catch the fish, we eat the fish, then we have the, the contamination in us. So it does move through the water, but not the same way that something that's soluble in water would, because the, the cesium is, by, it, once it reacts with something else, it is no longer soluble in water. At first, it's very hydrophilic, okay? The cesium itself uh, is a byproduct of the uranium uh, splitting process. When it encounters water, it throws off the hydrogen and grabs the, one of the, the remaining oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen forms sodium hydroxide, which is itself hydroscopic and absorbs moisture or travels in the water easily, but it's still very reactive. So even if you get it in a stream or the ocean, as soon as it encounters a rock, stone, even a bit of dust that's floating in, the, in there, then it reacts with that and forms something that becomes very stable. And then you just have to be able to filter that out. Uh, so uh, getting into groundwater, uh, apparently what we know again from is from 
the incidence in Chernobyl because we haven't had enough years to study Fukushima. It's only not even been two yet. But from the geology around Chernobyl, it seems to move between three and five centimeters per year down to the ground. So it probably will be decayed away physically before it gets to the level where our groundwater is. The concern right now is that we've been measuring food. You know, people grow plants up in uh, Fukushima, whether it's soybeans and rice, whatever, and we're finding very little contamination, much less than we feared at first. But we have to keep our vigilance up because it could get worse soon. With the contamination at the very surface, the roots are below it, and the roots don't pick up the contamination. But at five centimeters a year, in about five years, it's gonna be the level where the roots are, and suddenly we may have more contamination in our food than we had right after the incident. Could you just ask, what kind of devices are you gonna be using to measure water? Um, we'll be, we're trying to develop something now. We're trying to find a way to make this uh, tube work underwater so we can protect it from the water and the pressure of being you know, several meters under water and yet still be able to radiation to get through. And we'll, we're experimenting with, with that kind of thing. Also, there are other devices uh, similar to what's in here, which is a scintillator. So it has a solid sensor, which is much more uh, uh, durable from pressure, but is only sensitive to uh, gamma radiation. Underwater, that's not going to be much of an issue because the water itself is such a shield that we're not going to pick up any uh, beta or alpha radiation in the water anyway. Unless it's something floating in the water in a very high concentration, and then you could almost just put a glow stick in the water and see if it glows and it, it detect it that way. Um, the gamma sources, uh, even the gamma rays from, uh, from cesium, they have a mean length of only five centimeters. So you have to get the, uh, the sensor very close to it. But we're not looking for what's in the water. We're trying to figure out what's in the seabed, what's in the algae, the sponges, or the mud and stuff that's at the bottom, especially right near the plant up there. And we're doing that because there's another group that's more interested in oceanography and uh, uh, water issues, and they've asked us for help to try and develop something to be able to make that. Easy question. No, on the news, there were instances of houses Mm -hmm. Like one house that was radioactive. Ah, the one in Setagaya, uh, a little after the incident. Uh, yeah, because we've been measuring, and because a lot of other people are measuring, sometimes we find radiation in the environment that has nothing to do with Fukushima. Okay, somebody was uh, going along, it wasn't one of our sensors, but a similar one, and they found a hot spot in Setagaya. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like they had found one in Yokohama a few days earlier. And I went over there the next day, but the government had already removed the source of it. The source of the radiation in that case turned out to be some World War II era radium paint that had been stored under the floorboards in a house for unknown number of years. Okay, so on the sidewalk outside that house, it was five microsieverts an hour. Okay, and that had been that way for probably decades. And it just wasn't found or wasn't noticed because nobody was making the kind of measurements we needed. But it had nothing to do with Fukushima. Uh, we found some, uh, we've also been trying to check food, like he asked about. And so we've been buying things in the supermarket and measuring it. And one of our volunteers took a Geiger counter and was looking for things, trying to find something that was active enough to actually set off his Geiger counter. And he found some kombu that uh, actually had some activity. So he bought it, took it to, uh, back to our place, and tried to figure out what was in it, put it in the, 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 the uh, test rig we were trying to make, and we determined, wow, it looks like somewhere around 4,000, maybe 5,000 becquerels per kilogram. Where did this stuff come from? So we traced it, and it came from uh, the southeast corner of Hokkaido, and it was harvested after the Fukushima incident. Well, my first reaction was, well, the, the, the flow in the Pacific is north along Japan. It may be contamination from Fukushima. So we didn't have the equipment to characterize it perfectly, so we sent it to a laboratory. After a week and a half or two weeks, we got the results back from the laboratory. All of the radiation in there, it was almost 5,000 becquerels per kilogram like we measured, but it was all natural. It was from potassium-40, which is a natural substance in the ocean. Kombu has a lot of it because it's kind of like a vitamin. Because it was dried and had been uh, uh, dried out, that concentrated it and made it seem highly radioactive. But it had nothing to do with Fukushima. See, is radioactive. Yes. That yeah, wasn't right. And natural radiation or in natural radiation, the gamma rays are. Yeah, there's essence, a perception among a lot of people, uh, especially there was a video from a company in, in, in England that uh, if you get our, by our device and it'll tell you where the, you know, if there's any contamination because you want to know if there's contamination or natural radiation. And I disagree. The natural radiation or artificial radiation is harmful either way. 
okay? It doesn't matter where it came from. If it damages your DNA and causes you to have a mutation that can eventually become a cancer, it's just as damaging whether it came from Fukushima or it came from uh, an x-ray at a hospital or from, from the sun. Or radium hot springs? Radium hot springs. Radium hot springs are uh, actually used for therapeutic value, and there are people who uh, believe in what's called the hormesis theory, which is that low levels of radiation actually have some beneficial effect. I actually think that's true. Okay, there are beneficial effects from small amounts of radiation. The trick is, is does that small amount of benefit outweigh the detriment? Okay, and I believe that even at the lowest levels, any positive effect you might get is overweighed or outnumbered by the negative effects you get. Okay, you smoke one cigarette, you're going to get a little bit of you're going to, your attention is going to improve, you're going to feel more awake, you get the stimulation. That's a positive effect. It's completely washed out by the health effects of having ingested that smoke. So, radium hot springs, eh, no thanks. <laughs> yes. Um, now, you say that's too much uh, radiate kombu made right. by nature, right? Well, that one. Yeah. Then, Not too much, just more than we expected. Uh, yeah. uh, then, too much eating eating kombu harm, can be harmful? Potassium-40, uh, the source of the radiation in the kombu was uh, karyam yonju. Okay, karyam yonju is uh, uh, the most common radiation source uh, for biological uh, uh, creatures, including humans. Every food we eat that has potassium in it has a percentage of radioactive potassium. So whether it's banana or peanuts or kombu or anything else like that, you're going to get a certain amount. And actually, it doesn't matter if it's in there because you already have it in your body. People are talking about, well, if I eat a banana, I'm going to get a 0 0.02 microsieverts of radiation total. But that's only true because the potassium you got from the banana replaces the potassium you already had in the body. So if you didn't eat a banana or you did eat a banana, you're still going to get that radiation. It's just going to come from either new potassium or the potassium you had from last week. Actually, I got myself measured on a whole body counter uh, about a couple of months ago, September, yeah. September as well, but we don't. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a sample from Fukushima in my pocket when yes, I was <laughs> See, with me being normal, <laughs> the, the measurement that uh, that came out was literally the, 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 the K40 came out as a peak, and there was no other peak. There was no cesium peak or anything. So, but literally, you know, my body is radioactive because we eat combo or bananas. In my case, I eat, every morning I eat a banana. So you can very clearly measure that. And you have that, and that is really, that's gamma radiation coming out of your mouth. To compare, the limit for uh, food in Japan now is anything that contains more than 100 becquerels per kilogram of cesium, uh, radioactive cesium, can't be sold in the environment. Okay? By comparison, a banana has between 70 and 110 becquerels per kilogram of potassium-40. Okay? An ordinary person has about 4,000 becquerels total in their body at any given time. So that's, but that's almost all, almost exclusively from, uh, from potassium. The cesium is artificial. It's not something we even use as a nutrient, but our body <coughs> will accept it and treat it as potassium and use it in the same way. So it gets in our muscles, it gets in our, uh, our soft tissues. And mostly, uh, as long as you're eating a normal diet, if you get a small amount of it, it'll go out of your body in about three months and you won't have any more exposure. So if you were to go to Fukushima, or if you were to get one fish, or one, uh, say, persimmon, uh, taki, from uh, Fukushima, or have one a cup of tea that was from a contaminated plant, you will get a, a contamination of cesium, but very soon it will go out. The real worry we have is that people living up in Fukushima, or people eating that food regularly, it doesn't matter if their body clears it out, because they're eating the food every day, and they'll, they'll reach an equilibrium where they're being exposed to that radiation constantly. Yeah. No limit. They're free. <laughs> yeah. Can't the cesium have a, uh, an interaction with something in your body and stay there, like a piece of bone? Yes, it can, uh, but it typically doesn't. The uh, the reaction, the biological reactions of cesium in uh, in in humans, as bad as ones I know about, is the same as potassium. So that's why it gets concentrated in the soft tissues, which does bring us around to strontium ninety. Okay. Early on, we were very concerned about strontium ninety. 
Uh, and the, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's highly radioactive. Two, it's impossible for us to detect with a simulator or a gamma spectrometer. It gives out only beta radiation, no gamma at all. So there could be some of it on this table, and with this device, you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even read it. You have to have something that has a beta-sensitive sensor. But then, this device can't tell you what it is. So at first, we thought, well, we're measuring radiation out there, but there could be some that's invisible to us. If there's strontium-90, it would be very damaging. Because strontium is attracted to the, by the, to the body. We want Our body uses it the same way it would use calcium which means it gets concentrated in our bones and our teeth. It has a biological half-life, means once it's in your body, it tends to stay for 15, 20 years. So it would be there and it would stay. So it took us a long time to be able to determine whether or not there was strontium-90 in the environment. So we looked at the total amount of radiation, we looked at how much precision we could measure, and we were able to say that, okay, after a couple of months, it's probably less than 10%. And then as we got better and better measurements, we, we ruled it down to, okay, it's probably less than 5%. But it wasn't until months later we got careful uh, laboratory analysis that we were able to determine that it was actually less than half a percent. And now we're pretty confident that everywhere in Japan where there's cesium radiation, there's going to be less than or approximately 0.2% as much of strontium radiation. Okay. Are we over?